Yeah, yeah, do this. G'day everyone, how are you? Thank you and welcome to Walkley's Live here at Sydney Festival. My name is Benjamin Law and it's such a pleasure to be joining you all here on the sovereign lands of the Gadigal. First Nations people on this continent, like the Gadigal of the great Eora Nation, have been sharing stories and knowledge here for tens of thousands of years. Together, they constitute the oldest continuing human civilization the planet has ever seen, and we are particularly grateful to elders past and present that we can continue sharing stories and knowledge here on what is and what will always be Aboriginal land. Welcome to this session in our Walkley Live series, The Journalist Gene, where we look at the award-winning work of seven extraordinary journalists, exploring the national and international context in which their work took place, the influences and personal inspirations for their approach, and the professional drive, courage, and values that sustain them. Basically, what we're trying to do is to get them to talk a bit about themselves and their remarkable work, which can actually be a little bit harder than it sounds because most journalists are probably happier being on the other side of the microphone, drawing people out or talking uh, about their subjects. But as well as having our respected guests on stage today, we also have the participation of performer Angeline Penrith, who is going to animate dramatize and otherwise illuminate some of the background material to the work of these inspiring professionals. Now this series is a collaboration between the Sydney Festival and the Walkley Foundation which celebrates and supports great Australian journalism, setting the industry benchmark for excellence and best practice through, of course, the renowned Walkley Awards. Now, the journalist in the spotlight today is a senior reporter and presenter for Seven News. He's been with the network for 30 years now, serving as both a foreign correspondent based in the London Bureau and anchor to Seven's flagship news programs, the 6pm Bulletin, at Sunrise and the Man News Bulletins. And in a career that began in newspapers but quickly moved to TV, he's covered some of the biggest stories of our time across hotspots including Northern Ireland, Bosnia, the Middle East, Afghanistan and the Pacific Rim. In awarding him the Walkley Award for TV news reporting in 2015, the judges said that he displayed enormous courage in reporting with cool precision from his own evacuated newsroom opposite Sydney's Lint Cafe over more than 34 hours during the gruelling and deadly siege. Working alongside police snipers, despite being warned of the danger of the gunman's bullets and possible bombs, he used his exclusive access to break news while never sensationalising his courage. He's also won two Loki Awards and the Graham Perkin Australian Journalist of the Year Award. Please join me in welcoming Chris Reason. Thank you, mate. G'day, Chris. Thank you. Welcome, Chris. Cheers, Ben. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for making the time. Hey, look, I want to take you back. Maybe it's not a place you want to go back to, but we should probably start in mid-December 2014, the 15th of December specifically. So take us back there. When did you first hear something was happening at the Lint Cafe, and what was your response? Well, it was a, let me just paint the background of the day. It was an unusual day, an extraordinary day for me. I'd just come off six months leave, long mm -hmm. service leave, first day back at work, walked into the building just a little bit after nine o'clock and um, I admit I was having a bit of a midlife crisis. So I thought, no, I'm back here. The place hasn't changed. It's still the same. Do I really want to be back here again? I threw the, the bag on the desk and, and I walked out and, uh, and I thought, I'll grab a coffee. I'll just settle down and grab a coffee. Now, fortunately, I didn't turn right to Link Cafe. I turned left to another cafe, just a block down the street called Bond Cafe, sat in there, and that's when we began to see, at about uh, 9.30, streams of people running down Phillip Street, running away from Martin Place. And, of course, being a journalist, I dropped the coffee, ran outside and ran towards to see what was happening. I thought it might have been uh, an armed hold-up at the Reserve Bank just across the road. It wasn't. The police were at the front door of the cafe pushing everybody back, and the push beat me back as well. And, and that began what was 
quite simply the most extraordinary day of what has been a fabulous and privileged career covering some of the biggest events in the world. Mm. You know, uh, Boxing Day Tsunami, 9-11, Fukushima, travelling thousands yeah. and thousands of kilometres to cover those stories, and yet one of the biggest stories in my career lands 40 metres from my desk. Well, I want to go into some of the specifics of the day and what happened next, but just when you said before that people were running away and you being a journalist ran towards, I mean, the, the name of the session is The Journalist Gene. How much of that is training a feeling of duty and responsibility, and how much of that is innate and instinct? It's after 30 years of doing it for Channel, Channel 7 and others, it was, it was innate, it was built into me to go towards that story and to see what was going on. I think it is part of what, it, what you guys are beautifully calling the journalistic gene. It's a, it's a nice phrase, there's a curiosity there, a, uh, a desire to find out what's causing the incident in front of you that's, that's having these ramifications. And, and on that day, it was quite clearly obvious that this, uh, this situation was going to be an enormous one for the city, uh, for the country. And, uh, and so we settled into what would be uh, 24 hours of broadcasting. Didn't mm. stop from start to finish, didn't sleep, didn't, uh, didn't ever end, just kept going until, until that final broadcast at six o'clock the following night. I mean, so much of what was remarkable about that coverage when we think back about it was um, the duration, the stamina that you would have invested being there. I guess the other part of the equation is also access and how you got to be there. So can you tell us about how you managed to get yourself into that prime position, looking down into the Lint Cafe as, as 18 people are held hostage? Look, it, it's a question everyone wants to know and everyone and some journalists were getting quite irate and angry about the fact that they couldn't get similar access and we were given that access. It comes down to a couple of factors involved on the day and for those that um, don't know Channel 7, we are sitting right beside Bond Cafe. We're 52 Martin Place, they're 53 Martin Place and the massive, it's a massive glass fishbowl. For anyone that watches Sunrise, you can see that. 30 metre soaring uh, windows uh, all around the glass uh, roof as well, glass everywhere in that place, and uh, it's, it was an enormous vantage point, but it was one we were stripped of by the police. Mm -hmm. um, uh, soon after walking back into the building, I started broadcasting, jumped on the desk and rolled, uh, live rolling coverage, um, uh, and looked across at one stage about 9.45, 10 o'clock, and there was a police officer standing in the studio, and police officers don't usually come into newsrooms, and, and they announced that they were evacuating that building. And, and so it was. Now, that was about 10 o'clock in the morning. The way we got back in, I say fundamentally, first and foremost, the, 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 great, the greatest advantage we had was the fantastic work of my cameraman, Greg Parker, mm. who cheekily, naughtily, some might say uh, wrongly, um, uh, kind of imitated himself as a, a security guard and uh, told the police he needed to get back inside the building to do one last sweep. What he was actually doing was checking the cameras that he'd set up on the fourth floor of the building, um, trained out through our windows and onto Lint Cafe, and he'd left them rolling. Now, cameras only work if batteries are there and batteries only last an hour or so. So he had to change the batteries and get back out of the building. Well, as he was changing that battery, the long arm of the law literally grabbed him on the shoulder and said, what are you doing here? Mm. He was about to be thrown out, and just at that time, the um, police snipers team turned up, and they said to Greg, you work here, tell us about the building, what's the best site, line of sight to Lint Cafe, where's the best place for us to set up? And he said, mate, right here where this camera is. And Greg showed them the power of the 600 mil lens that he had on that wow. HD camera. And I talk about all the glass in that building, the most important glass that day was the glass in that lens. And he showed the police what that lens could do shooting in through the windows, the one, two, three, four windows as we labelled them, on the front of the, uh, the cafe, we could quite clearly see the gunman, he could quite see, clearly see the hostages. And that level of intel for the police at that time was astonishingly mm. useful. And they said, we can not only monitor the gunman, we can monitor the welfare of the, of the hostages. Will you stay in here with us? And will you, you know, sit next to me and we'll work together? So Greg was in there first. Uh, that was about 11 o'clock midday. And then for the rest of the day, we just worked the phones and we worked the phones and we worked the phones, trying to get a journalist back inside. And uh, eventually it worked. Five o'clock, I got a phone call saying, you've got approval, you can go back in. And so it was. Wow, and so just to recap something there, what initially starts as a white lie to ensure that someone can keep doing his job, ends up actually becoming 
a collaboration between the media and the police. Essentially, what I'm hearing is that you were able to facilitate them doing a better job than they expected to be able to do. It was an extraordinary collaboration, Ben. That's exactly right, and it doesn't often happen. Police and media aren't a comfortable mix, and so it shouldn't be. We should be separate, sure. and we should be uh, watching each other closely. It's our job to watch what the police do and the mistakes they make, the, the good stuff they do, both. Mm. But in this particular case, that sniper said, this is useful, and that relationship then expanded and the police were sort of realising that we had cameras everywhere in that building, cameras that could all be set up and trained in through the windows. And so it was that we set up cameras for them. We had two techn technicians that were al allowed, then allowed to come back into the building and they laid cable out to the police truck, which was parked right beside Channel 7, just out of view of man Haron Monas and his view from the, um, from the cafe windows. And so all of those camera feeds were mm. going in live to the police mobile operations centre and then being back, beamed back to the police HQ where the operation was being uh, conducted and, uh, and arranged. So it was a great collaboration mm. that really worked very, very well. And Chris, when you mentioned after that's established and set up, you get on the phones, who do you call? Who do you need to call? Called everybody. We called everybody we could trying to get back into the building. Because if you think about it, we'd lost, we'd lost our, our vantage point. We'd gone from having the very, very best vantage point of, the, of any media in the country. We were right there opposite this unfolding event of extreme importance and interest to the general public. And then we'd been evacuated and we'd been told to get out of the building. So we had nothing. We didn't have studio, we didn't have cameras, we didn't have editing suites, we didn't have satellites, we couldn't get feeds in, we couldn't put feeds out. We'd been neutered as a news organisation. It was incredibly frustrating, I argued unfair, and, um, and so, yeah, we got on the phone to the Premier, we got on the phone to the Police Minister, we got on the phone to the Commissioner, we got on the phone to everybody. There were little things that we had helping in, in our advantage. Our Chief of Staff was a former PR officer for the Commissioner, okay. so that was a nice personal relationship to be using. Um, we had uh, the Head of our Security, he was the former head of the SAS um, and he happened to be in Sydney that day and he was in the building so he was talking to the police all day and, and relaying our message saying that needs to the cops in charge on the scene can you allow some, someone else in can you get one more journalist mm. and I think also the fact that We'd proven that we were trustworthy, reliable. Greg had been in there by then for five hours. Not a frame of pictures had been leaked. No information had been broadcast that shouldn't have been. We were doing the job within the parameters, helping the police and not putting, reporting media journalism first. And they said, OK, we'll trust you a little bit more. We'll give you this one mm. more uh, access card with one more person to go in. Wow. Look, I know that a lot of the sequence of events is probably imprinted on our minds from what happened, but I do think it's worth seeing some of the footage and reporting from that day, just to remind ourselves of the impact of, of, that, of that period. After an almost 17-hour siege, an ending everyone had prayed would never come. Shortly after two this morning, teams of tactical response police stormed the Lint Cafe from either end, guns blazing. The cafe lit up with bursts of bullets and flashbangs, stun grenades, leaving the gunman dazed and some 15 hostages terrified. These extraordinary pictures captured by a single Seven News camera, allowed back by police into our evacuated newsroom directly opposite Lind Cafe and looking directly into the cafe's four windows. It was over in 34 seconds and in the silence afterwards, the only sounds, cries of pain and pleas for help. The beginning of the end came at 2.03 a.m. After hours of calm, the gunmen seemed agitated, suddenly moving the hostages around the cafe. But for those left at one end, an opportunity to run. Seven got out, but for those left behind, the harrowing sound of a single gunshot. The police sniper next to us saw what happened through his high-powered rifle sights. Window two, hostage down. Window two, hostage down. For police, a worst-case scenario.
they had no option but to pile in and take out 50-year-old self-styled Muslim cleric Manharon Monas, but not before he'd inflicted casualties of his own. Rushed to hospital, 75-year-old female shot in the shoulder, a 52-year-old female shot in the foot, a 43-year-old female in the leg, and a police officer with shotgun pellet injuries to his face. But two never made it. Mother of three, Katrina Dawson, and the cafe's manager, Tory Johnson. He reportedly attempted to tackle the gunman himself. We should reflect on their courage, um, the, the courage that they displayed during the many hours in that room. They had to make decisions, um, hard decisions, and our heart goes out to them. Throughout the ordeal, my cameraman and I were stationed here inside the Seven Newsroom, just up there on level four, of course, in complete darkness at the time. We were positioned beside the police sniper and clearly heard that first shot ring out and the sniper radio in those words. Window two, hostage down. A horrific end to a day where the hostages had shown such bravery. Forced to stand for hours at the cafe's windows, enduring exhaustion, fear and uncertainty. This young Lint staffer, eyes closed, hands trembling, at one point collapsed. Each under enormous strain, unimaginable pressures. The emotions so raw, the tears so real as the gunmen forced each to take shifts holding that notorious black flag and all the time an ever menacing presence behind them. We never saw Haron Monis put down the shotgun or remove that backpack, potentially holding explosives. Although Haron Monis has been called a lone wolf, it's clear he was at least an Islamic State supporter, a point made clear in this YouTube video produced inside the cafe. One hostage who identifies herself as Selena Win Pei delivered his three demands. One is to send an IS flag as soon as possible and one hostage will be released. But they were demands that would never have been met or considered. Today we must come together like never before. We are stronger together. We will get through this. We will get through this. Insisting the city will never be changed but knowing perhaps it already has. Well, Chris Reason, that, that footage is roughly half a decade old now, but mm. when, I, when I see that, like, that is still harrowing stuff. Like, I can feel my heart racing just watching that again. What's your reaction when you see that I, now? I, I try not to look at it too much. Just watching it then, I'd, I'd actually feel myself tear up a bit, Ben. It's, it's, it's really... It was difficult. It was really hard. Mm. You know... Um, when we've been talking to um, the other journalists for this series, you are all putting yourselves in pretty extreme situations. Um, we talked to Nick Moyer and Sylvia Leiber the other day, photojournalists who captured uh, what happened during the bushfires and, and the aftermath of it. Here you are in an incredibly difficult situation yourself as a journalist. Um, on a practical level, uh, how do you ensure, one, that you're safe, and two, that you're not in the way? Yeah, I mean, the second one was the most important thing. I'd, I'd been given this great opportunity by the police. I didn't want to blow it. I didn't want to get um, thrown out of the building. I had this amazing, what was, to be blunt, a commercial advantage that nobody else had. Mm. And, uh, and I didn't want to lose it. So when they led me into the building, I remember the young policewoman that led me in with a flat jacket on. And I said, thanks for doing this. And she said, don't thank me. I wouldn't be allowing it. Mm. A lot of the police didn't want us to, to be there. Um, the senior operator on the ground, the inspector inside the Channel 7 building, said to me, OK, well, this guy's got a backpack. We think there's a bomb in there. He's got at least one gun. He said, the line of sight down here on level three is clear. We said, if, he can, if you can see him, he can see you. Um, so you need to crawl. You need to move. If you need to move anywhere, then you need to do it down below the desk. So we spent the entire time crawling back and forth from building to, from uh, desk to camera and so on. Um, he said also, he said, look, if the... If that is a bomb, and if, there is, if it does go off, he said, you will hear it before you feel it, he said. Mm. So jump under a desk. And the whole building, as I say, is made of glass. So there was a real level of, of fear and panic there. But um, you didn't have to look too far, 30 metres across Martin Place, to see what real fear and real panic looked like and what they were in. I wasn't going to walk away from that. They said to me at the time, you can have one live cross and then you're out. And so we prepared for that 6 o'clock live cross. I did that live cross and then... Nobody came and moved me. Mm. So I just thought, well, I'm not going to leave. <laughs> so I just, I stayed there. Now, Greg was on one camera on that 
big camera with a 600 mil lens. So for the rest of the night, and as soon as I did that six o'clock cross for Channel 7, BBC were on the phone and CNN and Al Jazeera mm -hmm. and NBC and all of those. So I basically just kept going live, live, live all through the night. And then when night fell, the difficulty became that with television, you need light. So the, the light was on the camera. So I had to move the camera by myself, set it up again a little bit around the corner of the newsroom so Monos couldn't see us. So we took lots of precautions mm -hmm. and I made sure that I didn't ever cross the boundaries that the police had set. We didn't show their operational moves. I didn't reveal what was happening inside the Channel 7 newsroom, and there was a lot happening in there that I still haven't spoken about today. Suffice to say, when the lights came back on after the operation was done, police and federal agents came out of places in that newsroom that I didn't even know they'd been there, and I'd been there for 10 hours or something. They, there were a lot of agencies in there doing a lot of work, and um, we were told and, and obviously knew that we couldn't betray that. And above all of that, above everything, was the fact that if we had made one slip up, one mistake, you're potentially jeopardising the lives of the people inside. So that was on Greg and my mind the entire time. Mm. And we just didn't, uh, didn't risk anything. As you say all of that, I hear that keen sense of responsibility to this story and the, an understanding of what the stakes are involved in all of this. With that in mind, you did mention that there were some things that you couldn't show obviously because it would put people at risk, it would mm. jeopardise the police operation. What about other editorial conversations and decisions? With you as a team, what did you decide could and couldn't be broadcast given this story was developing so quickly? Yep. Well, it was interesting because, because the, the news bosses kept ringing me and saying, you must surely be able to tell us this and that. And I said, oh, let's not risk anything. I don't want to go there. It was totally between Greg and myself what we released. And his pictures inside his camera, from my knowledge, were only being taped. The only people receiving the live feed from his camera was the police van outside. So we had all of that information, all of those mm. pictures. We weren't even sharing it with our editors. We weren't even sharing it with Channel 7 at that stage because mm. we wanted to make sure that the operation had integrity and we didn't want to jeopardise the police work. We didn't want to risk the safety of the, um, of, the, of the hostages. And of course, we didn't want to get kicked out of the building. So we were very, very discreet on that. It was one interesting moment. I was doing a, uh, a cross to Fox and Friends and, um, and... The US network, the US show. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're just talking about yep. what was happening and they crossed and they said, oh, now, do we know anything about the government at that stage? Everyone in Sydney knew who the government was, all the media did, the word had got out at about 8pm who it was, and, and as soon as we knew it was Manharon Monas, we all knew Manharon Monas, he was a, he was a lunatic, and he popped up everywhere in the years before, protesting here, protesting there, outside courts and parliament, and we, I just thought, this, this guy isn't an ISIS terrorist, this guy mm. is going to be talked out, not taken out, and so there was a level of, I think, uh, for want of a better word, relaxation. It was kind of everybody sort of took a backward step and went, oh, okay, it's Man Monas. Anyway, when this Fox and Friends journalist sort of said to me, do we know who it is? And I said, yeah, we do. And he said, well, tell us. And I said, oh, we're not going to and release that detail at this stage. And the Fox and Friends guys couldn't believe that Australian journalists would cooperate with police, wouldn't share every single bit of information that they had available to them. And we spent... Uh, they went to an ad break and came back after the ad break. We would have gone for eight minutes on air at Fox and Friends debating freedom of the press and whether wow. or not press should be self-censoring. And, and we held our ground and said, that's what we're doing. And no matter how much they asked, we didn't reveal that information. Had you, had you come across those kind of fractures between the Australian model, I guess, or the, or the paradigm of journalism here versus what they do over there? Because essentially what you're saying is they, they're saying freedom of information completely must be upheld, whereas the Australian model is we can't compromise the safety of the subjects on whom we're reporting. I'm sure if an American journalist had been in the same situation, they would have been as protective of the information, but I think it's in their DNA. The freedom of information, the First Amendment, is just, is just part of it. They just talk. They just get information. They blab. Um, and, uh, and that's the way American journalism is. Australian journalism is a little bit different. Mm. Thankfully, I say. Now, I don't know where this is in the timeline of the story, but I think you were seven or eight minutes into a live broadcast of the siege when you mm. were told to evacuate, is that right? Yeah, so I was in that studio, taken over from Larry and Kylie, had their morning show going on, and it had all been sort of 
playing out and they'd been hosting and then the, the news boss said, can you take over? And I went down and started my broadcast and I was only seven minutes into that hosting when that police officer appeared and, uh, and pulled us out of the building. And I sort of went upstairs and said to the boss, what are we doing? We can't possibly give up this advantage. We can't possibly give up the freedom of the press, the freedom of us to be able to report what's happening and we had a massive row. Let's get a more palpable sense of what that moment was like. Our performer, Angeline Penrith, is here to give all of us uh, more access into what, how that moment played out. Hang on, what? Evacuating? No, absolutely not. Go where? You've got to be joking. You've got to be blippin', blippin', joking. Listen, I know I've been on leave for six months and this is my first day back, but journalism can't have changed that much in six months. First principle, we go where the story is. And right now, the story is here. Because if we leave, we are in a worse position than any other broadcaster. We won't even have our newsroom. Right now, we have, an, we have the Eagle Eye exclusive. And you want me to walk away from that? Well, bleepin' me, bleepin', bleepin' consequences. If he's got a bomb, then we get under the desk. That's my choice. Yes, and I can make that choice to stay. Yes, I know the, the walls are 20 feet of glass that will become flying projectiles, but I'm just willing to take that chance. Oh, come on, this is the biggest story of the year, maybe the decade. And you want me to leave all our cameras, batteries, and all the things we need to make television? All right, all right. But I think it's a mistake. I don't give a bleep about the CEO or the board. I'm telling you, it's a mistake. <laughs> Angeline Penrith, everyone. Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but you the bleeps were something else. Yeah, the bleeps exchanges. were something else. It did get quite <laughs> as animated as uh, Angeline made it out there. It was, it, look, I shouldn't um, uh, criticise my news boss at the time, Rob Rashke, a, a celebrated journalist, a fantastic operator, ex-South uh, African bureau chief uh, for the ABC, Walkley winner himself, and, and, uh, and he said, mate, it is a matter of safety and mm. he said we've got 150 people in this building uh, seven corporate have told us to evacuate insurance issues blah 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 we don't know about the glass the famous glass around the building if something happens we don't want to risk it and i said well mate if the cops are risking their lives i'm prepared to risk mine mm. we lost the argument and we lost the position that's not the only heated conversation that's going on at the time you mentioned before that other broadcasters wanted and felt that they should have the right to the same sort of access yeah. that Channel 7 did. What were those conversations like? Well, they were, they were heated conversations from what I heard from police media and, um, and the commissioner, police commissioner's um, press officer afterwards, in the days afterwards, there had been a lot of complaints and social media started to light up with, mm. you know, because people wanted, the audiences wanted their favourite journalists in the same uh, advantageous position. But the, the argument from us was, well, you know, no, you know, it's, it's our building. We're not going to let you into it the same you wouldn't let us into, into yours. And look, I think uh, when it comes down to it, I think uh, if future incidents like this happen, will, will they allow it again? I'm not sure that they will. Not mm. that anything went wrong. We got praised by the police commissioner and the operations chief as well about how we handled that broadcast and, and, uh, and, we, and the, 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 you know, the benefit that Channel 7 was able to give the police. Um, but I don't know that, uh, that they'll, they'll make that, um, that move again. And it's a pity because having independent eyes on something as important and as serious as a moment like that is critically uh, important for mm. the public. Just to know what the cops are doing. And as we saw with the inquest, there were so many mistakes made, so many um, uh, you know, haphazard moves and, uh, and folly from the police that really uh, have gotten to rewrite their entire terrorism Bible afterwards. And being there and being able to record that and see it and be part of that uh, mm. uh, public recording process was uh, terribly important. To clarify, I imagine the other broadcasters' argument would have been what? That this was a story that everyone had a right to see from... Yeah different broadcasters' perspectives. Is that, is that fair enough, Cop, do you think? Yeah, and, and, and they would have been arguing long and hard about it. The, uh, I think the journal from the Australian was, uh, 
was uh, was going you know, <laughs> was going nuts about it. But at the end of the day, the decision was made that uh, that allowed one that uh, to have a press pack inside that building would have just been too difficult to manage and would have taken valuable police resources away from the operation at hand. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned social media before, that people were having their own commentary about the coverage, about the situation yeah. itself. What about the official social media game? Because as much as you're doing live broadcasts, um, people are also probably tuning into social media to get that live, especially from Twitter, updates about what's going on. Do you need to be multitasking throughout of all of this as well? well? It's funny, I mentioned I came back from six months holidays yeah. and I just, my, my head was in exactly the wrong place. It, I wasn't, I've got to say, I wasn't actually proud of what I did that day. I, I could have done so much better as a journalist. I could have broadcast so much more. I could have been on multiple social media platforms. To be honest, I forgot all about social media. It wasn't until about nine o'clock, I think someone texted me, and, or just, no, it was just before the lights went out, so before eight o'clock, and said, um, mate, can you update us on Twitter? I went, oh, geez, Twitter, of course. So I started tweeting and um, put two or three out and then noticed my phone suddenly went dead. Mm. And uh, I couldn't work out what was wrong with it. It didn't really concern me that much. I had other things to do. But then it came to life about an hour later and I realised what had happened was that so many people, uh, both nationally and internationally, had suddenly logged on and the notifications coming through my phone uh, shut my phone down. So I went from 3,000 followers that day to 25,000 or oh, something wow. like that in the space of about two hours. So it was um, just the, the, the knowledge from people knowing that I was there front and centre, suddenly they wanted that information. And it just goes to show, though, that people, through no... It's not vulture-like, it's, not, um, it's not, uh, you know, not disrespectful, but genuinely the public want to be there. They want to see what's happening, the impact on their own lives. People they don't know, but they now mm. suddenly care deeply about those hostages. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think that the media has a duty and a role to channel that information. And mm. we saw it happening that night. So many people, everybody, was tuned in to those broadcasts watching the social media. Yeah. They cared. You mentioned before, Chris, that, of course, mistakes were made on the police's side. The inquest was... Um, a reckoning and a way to go through that methodically. At the inquest into the siege, the coroner agreed to play the triple O call that Tory Johnson, the Link Cafe manager, mm. made that morning. There's been a lot of comment and judgment about it, but Angeline will perform it here just to give a sense of what those hostages were going through and to convey the incredible courage of Tory Johnson. Triple O, what's your emergency? I'm calling from Martin Place. Right, can you tell me what street you're on? On the corner of Phillips Street. I need to read a message to you. Okay, can you just hang on a minute? Uh, Phillips Street, is that in Martin Place or Sydney? Phillips Street is Sydney, yeah. Okay, so that's in Sydney. Do you know the nearest cross street to where you are? The cross street is Martin Place and Phillips Street. Um, but Martin Place is not actually a street. Um, Martin Place... Yeah, oh, Martin Place is a street, yes. It's a pedestrian street. Uh, it's not actually a road. I, I need an actual road. So I can see Bent Street. Um, I can see Bridge Street. Are either of those near you? No. We're above Martin Place train station. Okay, so you're further down in this part of Phillips Street. So you're above Martin Place train station, are you? That's right, in between F Elizabeth and Phillips Street. Elizabeth, okay, that's a cross street from me, so that helps. Um, so Elizabeth, uh, so what have you got there? I have a message to read to you. Okay, about George Street. I don't know the exact location, but I ask them not to explode it. Three locations should be evacuated. Martin Place. So, this is a message that I'm reading from a person standing in front of me. Right. So, there's an object, is it? So, there's bombs in three locations. Okay. Yep. He just wants me to read the exact message. Okay. 
about George Street. I don't know the exact location, but I asked them not to explode it. Three locations should be evacuated. Martin Place and Channel 7. Circular Quay and George Street. Police should not come close to me or other brothers, otherwise they will explode the bombs. Some hostages have been taken. Okay, so hang on a sec, we've got Channel 7. What were the other ones that you gave me? Circular Quay and George Street. I'm just confirming where you are now. Lint Chocolate Cafe. That's where I am. Okay, just stay on the line for me, please. There's a bit more to the message I need to read to you as well. Okay, well, just hang on a sec. From the Lint Chocolate Shop, is it? That's right. All right, just stay with me on the line, please. Say closed, 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 April. Put it, put it on a piece of paper on both doors, closed. Have you closed the shop, have you? Yes, and both doors are locked. I need to finish reading this message. Yes, I understand that. Um, I have a gun in front of me. Okay. Well... What a frustrating you, call. What a frustrating call. And you do get a sense of Tory Johnson's steadfastness and focus, but also of the terror and the chaos that that situation um, had there. I mean, when I think of the span of your career, you've worked in conflict zones and reported on um, disasters. What happened at Martin Place in 2014 has been called Australia's first case of domestic terrorism. Did your experience, your prior experiences in the field prepare you for this particular story? I think I felt prepared because I had been in, in various um, terror situations before. I'd done 9-11 and uh, the London bombing, 7-7, and uh, the Marriott bombings in Jakarta, the Bali bombings, and mm. all, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of the Holsworthy barracks plot, all of these things. But it didn't amount to anything at the end of the day because we very quickly realised that um, Man Monos wasn't connected to ISIS. It didn't look like it was a, uh, a, a well-crafted and orchestrated plot from uh, professional terrorist operatives. It was crazy old Man Monos. And so once we learned that, as I mentioned before, that, that there was a kind of, a, a, everyone took a step backwards. And we honestly thought they were going to talk him out of that building and not have to um, do the, the, uh, the raid that they did, the action that they did. But um, it was what it was, you know. Th th there was that, obviously, that fundamental um, fear there that he wanted to make a statement. He was asking for an ISIS flag. He wanted uh, to talk to uh, Prime Minister Tony Abbott at the time. Um, you know, uh, we were always sitting on that edge, not knowing quite where he was going to turn, where, what he was going to do next, but at the end of the day we thought, no, nah, this will end peacefully. They will see him out and just exhaust him till he, mm. till he walks. It was interesting what you said before about, you know, you just come back from break, you're in a different mode, and there are things looking back where you're like, oh, I wish I could have done this better or this better about the story. You also mentioned that there was a lot of social media commentary, um, criticisms about approaches and all that sort of thing. As I understand it, um, there was a, a, an episode of Media Watch that focused on on your reporting at some stage. Was this about this incident or something else? Yeah, no, it was. Um, this is this is one that's come up uh, multiple times in my career, which has really been frustrating. I've got to say, it's uh, it was one incident that um, one, in fact, at seven seven bombings we just mentioned there, right. flying into London to cover what had happened there, and we managed to get what I was terribly proud of at the time, an exclusive interview with an Australian victim but it was inside the hospital where he was recovering. And some took great exception to that, and Media Watch dedicated an entire 15-minute program wow. to, the, uh, to, the, to the incident. It was, but it just frustrated me, Ben, because it was, it was a great get. It was a really good and powerful interview, and it was, uh, at the time, it was the first interview with any of the victims from that, uh, that awful uh, day. And it, it gave great insight into what had happened down in the London Underground. And, and I argued that we got it legitimately. You know, it was, it was uh, a, a good story and, uh, and the talent, uh, Dr. John Tullock, Professor John Tullock had agreed to do it. 
Uh, so, yeah, it was a little bit frustrating. It's a strange part of the contract of doing journalism and, I guess, telling stories, isn't it, that people will provide feedback and provide it so strongly sometimes. I mean, I almost wonder um, if someone was to heckle you what they would be saying right now and, and how they'd be conveying it, what they would actually say. Well, it's happened before, and I've been doing live crosses, and it's just people have come out of, uh, out of nowhere to suddenly... Uh, have a crack at what, uh, what I did in London. And it's, um, I think when you find out the details of that story, though... I love your journalism, Chris. <laughs> I love it. Mm. Seriously, you're a great journalist. And I don't use that word lightly, you know. A bloody great journalist. But I've got to say this. I've got to say it, because I love your journalism, so I have to say it. The thing that you did in London Hospital in 7-7-2005, I know it's been 15 years, but I've never forgotten it. Never forgotten it ever. Because you snuck in and you interviewed that man that, who was in hospital. He was hurt in the terrorism. And what you did, Chris, it's just not on, mate. Just not on. You exploited him. You did that. And I've got to say this, I've got to say it, I think that that was wrong. You don't do that to someone when they're caught in a terrorist attack. He doesn't know what he's saying or what he's doing. You took advantage of him, Chris, mate. And mate, it's not on. Listen, you're a great journalist. I know it, I know it. But that sneaking in, that's what gives journalists a bad rap. Mm -hmm. That's why you get called bloodsuckers, you know? So my question is, why'd you do it? Why'd you do it, Chris? Can you answer me that? <laughs> Angeline Penrith there with some of the sentiments that have been thrown your way. That, Maybe they're that even... That summarises all of the heckling <laughs> I've had through all the live crosses since uh, that happened in 2005. But why did I do it? I'll answer the question. Let mm. me defend myself. Because it was a great scoop and a great exclusive. But, but it was also one, I mean, I, to, to, to detail the background of it, I arrived in London, went straight to the hospital uh, where my editor had signed me to go, and just as I arrived, Prince Charles was walking out with a massive entourage, and, uh, and the camera that was following him on the Royal Rotor was a guy I knew, an Australian guy, and he came over to me and said, Rizzo, there's a um, Australian in there that uh, Prince Charles has just shaken the hand of and blah, blah, blah. We've got some pictures of it here. Um, I said, oh, what's his name? He said, oh, John Tulloch. He's in ward, whatever it was. And I went, well, if this guy's fit and able to talk to the prince, then maybe he's fit and able to talk to me. So mm. I walked straight into the hospital, went straight to the ward that the cameraman had told me the number of, and uh, went to the desk and I produced my card and handed it to the nurse, and she took it to the head nurse, and I think they consulted with the doctor either way. They, just, they walked to a bed, and I could see it was the outpatient ward. Uh, went to, the, uh, to Professor uh, Tulloch, uh, told him what my request was, and he said, no problems at all. Now, Tulloch was peppered with shrapnel wounds, wrapped with bandages, but his wounds weren't that bad. And he was in the outpatient, he was mm. going out in a couple of hours time. Uh, he was lucid, he was fantastic, I came over, I introduced myself. Now it turned out that he was a professor of media studies. And it also turned out that he spent the last six months at Channel 7 Epping doing a doctoral thesis mm. on Home and Away. He knew my stuff, he knew who I was, he knew what we were doing, and I said, fantastic, do you feel like an interview? Those days we didn't have, we didn't have digital phone cameras. I, I pulled out a little uh, handy cam uh, uh, camera and uh, held it like this as I interviewed him on his, on his bed and uh, we spoke for about 10 or 15 minutes. It was wow. great, I thanked him. I said, I'll let you get back on with the recovery, walked out. So a transparent and process, the world went nuts. a transparent process, uh, the person you're talking to was a friend and a fan of Channel 7's, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah. Um, I, I also wonder, thinking about that, that I wonder how your story and your approach would be regarded now in 2021. Do you think that with the proliferation of mm. social media, with smartphones, the ways in which citizen journalism has taken place, that what you did uh, with that story, with that interview, would be regarded differently now? Yeah, I think it would, and, and I think it's a really great question. I think the times have changed so radically where, you know, and I see this every day. In the old days, if we had a thing like the pandemic, the, the COVID, killing the hundreds of people that it has, we would have been interviewing the families of those people. I've seen very few. I've done one myself and no others, I think, with a family of someone who's lost someone to COVID. Um, we just don't push that line anymore. There's right. a resistance, a pushback on privacy. Uh, I, I, I battle with it. I don't, I don't understand. And I think that, 
I think that people genuinely want to share stories. And if they don't, they, they say no they, to the interview. But I think media should at least be able to ask the question, whether it's through a police officer or through a, uh, you know, a knock on the door, whatever it might be, would you like to? No, okay, if you don't. But I've found in my career that many, many people do. And, and, but to get into the hospital and to do that story and to get that interview, that, that's, you know, that's something I've done in my career many, many times. And... Uh, not ashamed of any of those, uh, those, those great gets. My favourite one, um, Nelson Mandela's funeral in 2013 in Soweto, a very grave and serious day, obviously, for South Africa, the, the Soweto Stadium full of thousands of people. We were there covering that extraordinary event, and uh, I wanted to get an interview with Tony Abbott, Prime Minister at the time. He was saying no. I said, oh, I, I want to get an interview with him. So I went round to the VIP box where all of the, the world leaders were, and... Um, and there were lines of soldiers out the front, mm. the world's press sort of waiting to see their leader come out of this box. And the leaders were walking from the VIP box in an elevator and going downstairs. And my cameraman at the time, Tim Stewart, who had a brilliant idea, said, well, if they're taking this elevator down to wherever they're going, why don't we walk up the fire escape and take the elevator from above? Mm. And we did exactly that, press the button, we go down, opens the door, and all of a sudden I'm standing there, no security, and an array of the dazzling array of world celebrities, royalty, power. There's Bill Clinton, George Bush, President Obama, Tony Blair, Bill <laughs> Gates, um, Richard Branson, Bono from U2, everybody. I just said, start rolling. And we, just, <laughs> and we start, the first person I roll into is Francois Pinar, the celebrated Springbok captain. And I use my favorite question at a funeral. I use the same question every time. It, never fails to elicit a powerful response. Two words, difficult day, Francois Pinot. Wow. And Francois gives me a beautiful sound bite. I turn around again and there's um, Prince Frederick of Denmark. Prince Frederick, Chris Reason, Channel 7, difficult day. Bang, off he goes. Great thing. <laughs> Bill Clinton walks past. Mr. President, difficult day. Clinton <laughs> gave me a beautiful wow. response. It was extraordinary. And I turn around again. I got Abbott over here, Bill Short, and I thought I'd better balance the books. And then coming towards me, this one of the world's great dictators, surrounded by, by, uh, by, by security, hand, wobbling on a walking stick, and it was Robert Mugabe, not known to give interviews to the Western press. Difficult day, Mr. <laughs> President. Gave us a wonderful soundbite. We, we, we left the room chasing Bono, and we couldn't get back in, but... But by t lateral thinking and by thinking a way mm. around something, running the opposite way to the pack, it's a great way for journalists to get, to get into places where they should be, mm. to be there at the source of events, to be not getting information secondhand or through press releases or through PR or through, in the London hospital case, the spin doctors. And I said to them at that time, I'd rather talk to the real doctors than the spin doctors. And it's the same every single time. Ty Caves, two years ago end of that marathon rescue operation. Everybody was exhausted after two weeks of trying to get to the, those kids out. Three days of rolling broadcasts as they grabbed all those kids and brought them down the four kilometres of tunnels. Everybody collapsed. Everyone mm. was exhausted. And I thought, well, if everybody's collapsing and exhausted, maybe the police guarding the caves will also be collapsed and exhausted. Jumped in the car with the cameraman, went past the first guard post, two cops sleeping on the desk. Wow. Drove slowly past, wow. past the second um, security thing. No one there. We drove right up to the front of the Thai caves. I said to the cameraman, start rolling. We walked in and we were inside the caves, the focus of world attention for the last two weeks. We're standing there, pointing out the holes, the pumps, the, all of the, the, everything. 15 minutes later, one of them woke up and evacuated the whole place and we were gone. But we had a great world exclusive. I think three broadcasters were in there at the time. I think you've added a lot to people's toolkits here who work in the media, lateral thinking, a bit of chutzpah, and difficult day. I mean, that's, that's something we can all take <laughs> with us after today. I mean, look, you, you've worked in some pretty intense stories. You've been covering terrorism, global hotspots, even something like the Thai cave story. You're covering stories about, about trauma. Mm. And as we've been speaking to journalists for this series, one of the things that keeps coming up is that you are able to absorb trauma by covering trauma. And I'm wondering, in, in your work and through working in these stories in particular, how do you protect yourself? Yeah, it's a really interesting question and one I've thought about a lot in my later years as, um, as I start to slow down a bit. But um, I think it's a really interesting and, and difficult question that journalists uh, 
often decide to look away from, walk away from, ignore, you know, compartmentalise, all of that sort of stuff. And I think that's not a healthy place to be. And most mm -hmm. journalists and you know, the, uh, the previous generation that I come from, drinking was a major way to cope with those things. We'd all meet in bars and talk and, and you know, detail the great stories, the, the successes, the losses, etc., etc. But it was a process of, of talking and, uh, and, and getting it off your chest and out of your head. I think that's changed in recent years. Um, uh, you know, I think journalism has changed. I think it's the style of journalism has changed. But I think journalists see things that, um, that they're perhaps not trained on. No, they're not trained to. No one ever gave me training. And I know we don't train our current um, regime of journalists about how to deal with trauma properly. And I, I think it will be an, a growing issue as, um, as years go by. Mm. Talking and what else has worked for you? Uh, well, talking, um, sharing, uh, I've never had to reach the, for the phone for a psychologist or anything like that. I, there, was, there was a time I remember going, the Threadbow disaster really hit me hard and, uh, and I struggled with that for a long time. And, um, uh, and again, it was, it was just the process of talking with great mates, with cameramen, with journos, with friends, with family who help you get through that. I, my father was a police officer and I think most first responders probably do the same thing, that they park their emotions. They realise that what they have to do is important and has to be done. And I genuinely think journalism, still to this day, I'm passionate about it. I think it is an extremely important uh, player in our society. We need to have that industry working uh, on multiple levels and for thousands of reasons. But so, uh, you know, but that comes at a cost. And, you know, you sort of park those feelings, those emotions, and I think at some stage, you know, they might well come back to, to cause problems and mm. bite you and all that sort of stuff, and I'll deal with that when it happens to me. Now, Chris, journalism is about documenting human lives, but it also has the capacity to honour human lives mm. as well um, and the absence of them. Uh, we do need to acknowledge in this session that tragically two hostages did lose their lives that night at the siege, Katrina Dawson and Tori Johnson. By way of memorial, Angeline is now going to read a little bit of the tribute that Tori's partner Thomas and his parents Rosie and Ken put into the public domain as part of the siege inquest report. Um, and we present this with respect and in memoriam of both Tori and Katrina. Up until 2012, Tori worked as a restaurant manager in Darling Harbour. Stressful weekends, long hours, and physically hard work. It started to affect his health, and I suggested to him to leave work and take up architecture or design. Something he always wanted to do. He planned to build a house for us one day. In his free time, he would source ideas from magazines, the internet, or take pictures of interesting buildings. He never got around to do a course. After he was attacked over a taxi on his way home from work on a Saturday night, we decided he needed to leave Darling Harbour and seek employment in a safer environment. So he took up the position as manager of the Link Cafe at Martin Place. He was overqualified for this role and although he enjoyed it, it was not his dream job. Our dream was to move to the country, build a house and get a dog. That simple. We had already found the meaning of life, our love for each other. Tori started to build a model of what our future house could look like and it still is sitting in our living room. He told me about, he told me about a huge surprise he had and obviously he could not tell me what, what it was. I will never know what that meant. When I received the call in the morning of December 15th, I felt it was all coming to an end. Tory being the manager, I immediately understood the risk and threat to his life. My young man, who could not hurt a fly, lived a selfless life in pursuit of his happiness and derived his meaning of life by caring and being there for the ones he loved. He never had a choice but to stay with the hostages, and he knew it. Any actual or attempted escape would mean someone would get hurt. Tori had more courage than anybody, anybody else that night. 
He was not only a brave man, he knew he was abandoned and he knew he would die. After one of many fire shots that missed, he put himself back on his knees to finally be shot in the head. I can feel him present every day. Tori is with me in my heart. Our love for each other is still growing and can never be taken away by anything or any, anybody. It will continue to exist for a long time after our lives have come to an end. In loving memory of my partner, darling Tori, we will never forget Thomas. Pretty powerful and haunting yeah. words, hey. Um, you know, Chris, I look at your career, 30 years now with Channel 7, is that right? Mm. Congratulations. On, um, on Christmas Eve, 30 years ticked over. That's remarkable. And we have spent a lot of today talking about the importance of journalism and the Fourth Estate and the work that you do. But I almost want to know why you specifically keep going at it. What is it about this kind of storytelling that motivates you personally? I, I, I still love it, Ben. I still get a great thrill out of doing it, and I feel, still feel a great responsibility. And I still, as I mentioned before, I think there's just such an enormous role to play. And I'm really concerned, in fact, terrified at the way mainstream media has now gone from a, almost a term of endearment down to a term of insult, you know, lamestream media and all that sort of stuff. It's, um, I, I know that you know, the mainstream has breached trust on various levels and outlets and times and from all sorts of things and Murdoch's, you know, uh, phone tapping scandal mm -hmm. in, in the UK and, and beyond. But at the end of the day, I look at what mainstream media does and it's so terribly important. I look at what my, the work of my colleagues and I know that what they do is, is they're doing all the things that, that, that I joined journalism for back in, um, after university. You wanted to save the world, you wanted to hold the powerful to account, you wanted to find truth and seek justice and all those sorts of things. It was a, that was the genuine motivation. I think most journalists were started out like that and, and at the back of it all, there's a, scent, there's a, there's a driver that, that works like that, trying to do something responsible and do something that helps the community. I'd sort of argue that Facebook and all the social media platforms and everything, all that you know, caught the drift of eyeballs and, and readership away from mainstream and onto those social media services, I just don't see the value. And I get terribly scared by the fact that more and more people are putting their faith in, in what those outlets are. We've seen how dangerous they can be with the US elections, Russian interference, Chinese bots, all of that. And I think. We need to get our audiences back and we need to re-establish trust and we need to have uh, a healthy uh, fourth estate. So in this era where there's so much misinformation, where con conspiracy theories about, abound and trust in journalism, trust in media is perhaps at a crushing low, if you were talking to young people in the industry right now about gaining trust and the importance of doing that, how would you advise them to start regaining that trust with their audiences and readers? Oh, I think transparency, honesty. Um, I think we have now more tools available to us as, as, as editors and uh, news directors now than we've ever had to show the audience and show people how we gather stories and how we put stories together. I'm talking about, you know, we can... We, we might get a complaint. We can deal with that complaint online now and flesh out what it is that that complaint or that uh, strand or you know, uh, complaint on social media might have been. We can talk more to our mistakes and we can be honest about them. Uh, embracing programs like Media Watch, which I always have, I think, apart from that one episode. <laughs> I've been on it dozens, <laughs> dozens and dozens of times and all of them justified apart from that. But it was it's healthy to have and it's, it, criticism's important. It lifts us up, it makes us react and, and, and keeps us honest. And it's the same sort of criticism I'm talking about with, the, with us watching the police at Lint that mm. day. Um, but at the end of the day, to tell the young journalists to keep going, to stay straight, to be honest, to try and do their journalism as faithfully as they can, to follow the basics, the objectivity, uh, balance, truth, accuracy, um, it's all we can do. But it's better than anything else. Mm. 
is my ultimate argument. It's better than anything else. It's flawed, it has problems, sometimes it has political slant. Uh, I tell anybody you know, having this argument about media that the best way to, uh, to deal with media is to consume more of it. If you think the ABC is too left, then you know, balance it out reading The Australian. Occasionally watch the crazies on Sky News After Dark. Just the more it's media the healthy you food can... pyramid <laughs> of media consumption. <laughs> Maybe Sky News After Dark should be a sometimes food. Uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> anyway, don't get me started on that. But, look, I, look, I mean, even, even that organ of of the media, you know, it, it creates debate and, mm. and instead of silencing it, it needs to be debated back. I, I worry about the loss in radio, for instance, of left-wing commentary. Where's Mike Carlton gone? His great old show that he used to have and we saw the Joneses, etc., run off in that direction, not criticising them. That's, you know, it's about a healthy, plural media. They're all going to have a, a, a variety of political positions over the spectrum of politics, but what we need is more of it. Hmm. And we need more journalists and we need uh, more people reading a greater and wider disparity of journalism. Hmm. Well, Chris Reason, thank you so much for your wisdom and your work. Could you please all join me in thanking Chris thank Reason? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Well done. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you also for being a great audience. And please also join us in thanking Angeline Penrith for her wonderful performances yeah. today as well. The writer and director of the Walkley's live series is Alana Valentine. I'm Benjamin Law. And please do send the Sydney Festival your feedback about Walkley's live, the journalist Gene, so that we can continue to showcase exceptional journalism in years to come. Thank you so much. Have a great Sydney Festival, everyone.